So I'm uh, Florian at OpenBSD, and um, today I'm going to speak about um, the stateless, uh, stateless address auto configuration daemon. That's a way to get um, v6 addresses on your uh, host. Um, first, a bit about myself. This is the first time I speak at a, a BSD conference. So, um, uh, by day, I'm a, a sysadmin uh, working on uh, DNS and um, uh, BGP things. I uh, work for a non-profit in uh, Europe. <coughs> and I've been an uh, OpenBSD hacker since uh, 2012. Uh, in the beginning, I got, I got an account for uh, implementing um, NetFlow version 10 or uh, IPFIX in uh, PFLOW, which is uh, OpenBSD's uh, NetFlow exporter. This allows it to export um, IPv6 uh, um, flows. And I was one of the uh, de facto um, MG maintainers, which is uh, an, a tiny Emacs clone that we have in base. Um, after that, uh, what I like to call the web years, uh, CEO tricked me into uh, transitioning uh, our fork of Apache 1.3 to Nginx. Uh, at the time, we had uh, both web servers in base, but um, we needed to move to one of them, get rid of the other one. Um, with the switch to Nginx, uh, we, um, we needed a way to run a CGI script, um, so uh, a write complaint about that, uh, which got me to write a slow CGI, which is a wrapper from fast CGI um, supported by Nginx to run CGI scripts. And half a year later, I got a write back at him um, by helping getting him drunk with a few other people. And in the morning, he woke up and accidentally had HDPD committed. So we could get rid of our uh, Nginx there. Um, and then back to IPv6. This again was an offhand uh, remark by Theo. Um, why do we have two binaries for, for trace route 6 and trace route and two binaries for ping 6 and ping? So, so we can have twice as many blocks. Yes. Or as someone pointed out on the mailing list, if you break one uh, tool, you can use the other one. So you break ping, you can't ping with V4, but you can still ping over V6. Well, so, to, so, so it turns out with uh, a trace route 6 and trace route, this was actually quite easy. Um, trace route 6 was just a copy of a trace route, um, replace basically all I, uh, AF inet with AF inet 6, have a bit of uh, uh, shoveling around with uh, printing of addresses, and that was it. So merging them was quite easy. Uh, just uh, apply the standard way of writing um, address family independent code, and that was done. Yes, uh, that that was uh, one of the problems with ping. Um, so we got rid of uh, quite a few of them there. But the actual biggest problem was that. Uh, ping 6 and ping um, evolved uh, uh, next to each other. Uh, some improvements went into uh, a one program and other improvements in the other, so they couldn't be merged. So I needed to pick and choose, so this could, uh, took uh, quite a bit longer. Um, yeah, so that work then made me the uh, IPv6 guy and, and uh, OpenBSD, and uh, CEO suggested that I should be Florian 6. <laughs> um, so I guess it was then up to me to uh, write SlackD. Um, our IPv6 stateless address auto configuration daemon. And so, why would one do such a thing? It, it sounds unpleasant, right? Well, so here's why. Um, th this is the actual commit message uh, when I was able to remove all this code from the kernel. So, what we could do is uh, get, a rid get rid of um, over 2,000 lines of pretty code uh, from the kernel and move all of that into user land. <clears throat> so, to explain why that code was uh, nasty, um, a quick prime on IPv6. Um, well, I hope you, you all have some time, right? Six. Yeah. Uh, only the part that we need for Slack. Um, so, addresses are 128 bits. Uh, this is, yes, this is the first lie. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. It was actually in my talk. Uh, the known universe, uh, 0 slash 0 in, in uh, V4 talk, so this is all 0 slash 0. 
Uh, your ISP gets a slash 32 allocated. Um, your ISP is supposed to um, hand you a slash 48 or a slash 56. And you're supposed to um, assign a slash 64 on a, a layer 2 collision domain. Shush, Peter. If you said should, no, I'm happy. <laughs> I saw your drawing breath there. <laughs> so, how, how do you get an address? Um, in v6. Well, you can configure it statically. Uh, you can use uh, DHCP v6, mm, very similar to, to v4, and you can just pick one at random. That's a new thing. Uh, because you have 2 to the power of 64. So you uh, fire up your random number generator, 4, and pick that address. Uh, you need to know from where uh, those are router advertisements. And uh, you need a way to uh, pick them uh, without colliding. So if I pick four and you pick four, that's probably not good. Uh, so you need a way to detect this, um, which is still in the kernel and uh, will stay there. So I'm not going into that. <coughs> um, how can I pick an address without colliding? Uh, in the uh, RFC speak, this is uh, finding an interface identifier. Mm, one modified EU64 which is a fancy way of saying, uh, take your MAC address and sh uh, shove it in there. Uh, another way is um, pick one fully at random. Those are temporary addresses. And uh, the now preferred wa way over the EU64 um, addresses are semantically opaque <coughs> interface identifiers. The idea there is that your address is random, but stable over reboots. So you pick a key, uh, do some hashing over it, and chop that into your uh, address. The upshot there is um, that it's much harder to guess. So you need to, uh, if you scan a subnet, you need to scan a, a, um, all 64 bits. If you shove a MAC address in there, that can be, the, the entropy can be considerably lower, uh, especially if I know um, what kind of hardware people or what kind of MAC address people are using. So at work, we're a Mac shop. So uh, that does not have a 48-bit entropy. If you're running, uh, I believe it was VMware, you have an entropy of 24 bits. Uh, I can scan that with my phone. Uh, so this is a way to mm, get higher entropy and have this stable. Um, only about uh, global addresses. Um, this is a, a quick one. Uh, we Local addresses, this is something specific in uh, IPv6. They're always there, and they're getting picked uh, out of the well-known uh, FE80-64 uh, prefix. Either um, embed the MAC address there or um, the semantically opaque identifier. <coughs> and we need uh, um, multicast addresses. There are, uh, for our purposes, uh, two well-known ones, the old nodes one and the, the uh, old routers one. So why is this stuff complicated? We basically need uh, uh, two addresses and uh, the prefix length. Um, so we need to transport uh, two 128-bit numbers and an 8-bit number. Um, so let's look how this is implemented in the uh, router advertisements. The, the, the router advertisements are a periodic uh, ICMP v6 packet sent to the old node uh, multicast address or it's sent as a response to a um, solicitation sent by a host to the uh, all routers uh, multicast address. Um, information you get from a router advertisement. Um, this is the, the link local address of your gateway. Talk to that thing if you want to reach the internet. That's implicit. That's from where mm, the, the router advertisement came. <coughs> it contains the diameter of the internet. That's important information, I guess. Uh, it has two flags in there. Uh, one means, uh, yeah, uh, I don't actually have a prefix for you. Uh, go over to DHCP v6 and uh, look there. And the other one is, yeah, I have a prefix for you, but for, for uh, other information like uh, which resolver to use or which NTP server to use, uh, go over there, ask DHCP. And uh, it has a flag in there uh, for, or, sorry, uh, it has uh, a time value in there. Uh, for how long the uh, gateway is valid. And if that is zero, then don't use that thing as a default router, which is a bit weird. So this is how this looks on wire. This is from the RFC. 
Note, however, that there is no prefix. That this is why we are doing all the song and dance. We want the prefix. It's not in there. So where is this? There was this options field at the end. <laughs> Happy? Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, options field. Um, the, on, the option has its own uh, header again, uh, consisting of a type and a length and a, um, a rather weird encoding. Um, no matter. Um, and there are quite a few options. And so we, there is on, on uh, the, um, the third point, there's our prefix now. Um, we can also encode uh, our resolvers in there and uh, a search list option. Um, I have a snarky remark about that later. So, prefix looks like this. Um, so again, yeah, it, it, it starts with the, with the option header where uh, the length is encoded. This is actually quite easy uh, because it will always be the same length. Um, when, when we figure out from the type, uh, that will be the length. Um, because in the, in the prefix, the full address is encoded. It doesn't matter what the prefix length is. The rest is just zero. And um, we have two flags in there. Um, if the address is on link, uh, I will come back to that later as well. And if it's um, the A flag, uh, no. Yes. Yes. No, I do wonder if prefix length is fixed for for global scope addresses always. Has it developed no. like anything <laughs> else other than fixed for? Yes. Do you see that? I wrote it. So yeah, uh, we can handle other things than uh, slash sixty four and uh, router advertisement the. And, and OpenBSD will hand that out. OpenBSD uh, yes. Okay. Mm. <laughs> no, I did not purpose. Where was I? Oh yes, the uh, A flag, uh, autonomous, uh, autonomous address, something. Uh, that means you can actually use this prefix to form. Um, your address, uh, address on the interface. So what's with the other prefixes? This is all a bit weird. Well, anyway, um, so we also have um, two lifetimes in there, uh, valid lifetime and preferred lifetime. Uh, valid lifetime is the abs absolute length uh, on, on how long you're allowed to use a formed address. Um, preferred lifetime is shorter than the valid lifetime. So when you reach the valid lifetime, uh, the address just disappears. Uh, it gets deleted by the kernel. Um, preferred lifetime uh, is shorter than the valid lifetime. And this is the lifetime um, for how long you can use the address for, go uh, for, for outgoing connections. So the idea here is uh, you um, open the connection. Uh, the preferred lifetime expires. Uh, you don't want to tear that down immediately. So maybe it's a, it's a long-lived um, connection. So much for the theory there. Uh, what, what happens in practice is um, these uh, 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 lifetimes get renewed by you you're getting a new router advertisement or you're sending a solicitation to get a new router advertisement and then those timers get renewed. Except for the temporary addresses that uh, expire intentionally. They're only used to, they're supposed to be short lived. Yes, I think I went through all this. Right. Um, so wh why is there this A flag in there, as in I can use this prefix um, and what's with the uh, onlink flag? The idea is there, there is a full or half-assed uh, dynamic routing protocol in here. Um, a router is supposed to hand out all the prefixes that it knows. Uh, and a few of them you can uh, form addresses of. But if it's uh, connected to, to another link, it's supposed to hand that information through. And so, yes, an Aldrich horror from me on space time. 
there's a dynamic routing protocol in there, uh, but complicated state. It needs to dig around with the uh, um, uh, routing cable. Um, and an unknown amount of <coughs> options that have a variable length. This is difficult to parse. This is what uh, um, image formats trip over. And you have that in the kernel. That's probably not good. Um, additionally, there are complex timer interaction with the, with the lifetimes, which is, mm, it is easy to implement, but not so easy in the kernel. Uh, you, you just don't have uh, uh, all the abstractions that you need for that. Um, so in, in the kernel, it's, it's kind of single processed. Uh, you, you for sure don't have privileged separation or privileged drop. You're in the kernel, you can do everything. Um, and it was getting in uh, into uh, in MPI's way to for for fine grained uh, network locking. It had its ten tentacles everywhere. Oh, and uh, I saw a smarky comment uh, uh, about the uh, DNS search list option. Uh, I have an invoice number for that one. Um, so someone got this wrong. Um, to be fair, it was in user land. Nobody is crazy enough to do this in the kernel. Uh, yeah. So again, um, that's why this is good. Um, Let's uh, have a look at uh, userland, why, why it's better to do this in userland. Um, in, in OpenBSD, we have a, a, a huge body of experience with this um, to write privilege-separated demons, uh, literally for, for decades. Uh, here are a few examples of, of what we have. So we have the SSH is uh, the first one, I believe. Uh, a lot of routing demons. Um, our web stack is in there, um, NTPD. That kind of thing, and we are even have a TCP uh, privilege separated. So the protocol is actually running with an unprivileged user uh, uh, change route to the way. Um, another upshot of this is uh, that they all follow the same uh, the same pattern. So if we discover something new or we decide to implement an old idea, it basically applies to all the things. Uh, so we implement it in one, uh, it, it works, and then there's a huge flurry of uh, commits to, to bring it into all of the, the other ones. Uh, two, two recent examples uh, are, previously we only did a fork uh, for the uh, um, unprivileged children, uh, which is kind of good enough. Uh, so the, the, the child then priv drops uh, to, to a, a, um, a different user and trucks along as unprivileged. But the downside is it, is, it actually has the same address space. It's not randomized. Uh, well, it is randomized, but it's the same uh, address space at, as the parent process. So you have an information leak in the, um, in the child. Uh, you can use that to uh, maybe attack the parent. With a, a fork and re exec you get a different uh, memory layout. And um, another uh, recent -ish addition is uh, Platch, which then also applies to uh, all the demons. Um, people want to hear about Platch or were you all in Bob's thing? This is quick. Well, well. So, um, Platch runs in a, um, with, when, when you call Platch, you're, you force your process into um, a rest restricted environment. As in, uh, if you Platch standard I.O., from here on out, I will only talk to already open file descriptors or pledge standard IO INET, I will only talk to open file descriptors or the internet, as in I will do an accept on a socket, or I will open a socket and uh, do a connect, that kind of thing. Um, if you try something else, uh, you get an uncatchable uh, uh, secret board and die. Mm. Common parents here, um, privileged operations, you pull them up, uh, you hoist them up before um, uh, at, at startup before uh, the first pledge call, uh, things you don't want to pledge uh, because they're just uh, there's no chance in, in doing this later. Um, untrusted data that comes in from the outside, you process that in a in a process that's uh, um, very harshly pledged with a standard I/O. <coughs> And uh, another thing is to further drop uh, privileges when you're done initializing. Um, a, a subset of the privilege-separated uh, demons are the privilege-separated routing demons. 
uh, they, they fo follow all this pattern. You have a config file, you have a um, logging framework um, where you can also specify I want to run this in, in debug mode so it does not um, it demonize, it stays in the foreground. Or um, normal operations, of course, it is locked. So, um, you get a control socket to uh, use the uh, control programs to talk to the running daemon to uh, query it about its state. And they consist of uh, three processes. Uh, the main or apparent process is spins everything up, uh, the front end and the engine. So the, the main process um, it stays root. It brings up all the other processes and sets up a, a full mesh of uh, pipes uh, for communicating and a file descriptor passing. Um, it also allocates uh, privileged resources and hands them off to the children. And it handles um, the most privileged operations, like a changing the routing table or uh, configuring address on, uh, on any place. Um, the front end process is uh, chain rooted away to a var empty. Um, it has no privileges there and drops privilege to uh, an unprivileged user, and that's not nobody. There's a, a specific user for each daemon because otherwise they could still K trace each other or uh, send themselves a signal. So this needs to be a different user. Uh, it's usually uh, pledged standard I.O. Uh, because it needs to talk to other things and INET or something else that allows it to talk to the outside world. And it, it's there to receive uh, un, uh, untrusted data from the outside world, but it, um, and then it passes the data on to the engine process. Um, so the engine process also changes through the way to var empty, uh, drops to an unprivileged user, and then uh, receive data and uh, process it and send it away. Uh, so it gets the data from and process, parses it, and, and asks the other process on its behalf. <coughs> so for example, for um, what, why this is safe, um, when one of the um, various timers expires, in Slack D, um, we need to send a new solicitation. This is something that the engine process decides to do. Um, but it can't do it, it itself. So it sends a message to the front end process, can you please send a solicitation for me? Um, so say you manage to exploit the engine. It can't do anything. It, it can't tell the front end, please send a solicitation. Those are two 8-bit numbers. One is uh, the message type, please do this thing for me, and the other one is the interface ID. Um, try to, to get buffer overflow with that, that's pretty difficult. It's probably possible though. Um, in, so we, we, we have these uh, routing demons in, in base, but um, they do things. So they're a BGP speaker or they're an OSPF speaker. Uh, so you need to rip out all the things uh, that, that, that makes them uh, this particular demon and then put your own things in. Luckily enough... No, I wrote BGPD, nobody told me that you guys are going to agree with all of this. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, <sorry. laughs> so um, Ken did a few, two years ago or so that they have a lifting and um, extracted all the specific things um, and left the skeleton there. Um, and it's there. Um, right. Two. Um, the actual thing. Slack D. How am I doing on time? Oh. Um, some of the features. Uh, it's in. It's started very very early. Um, so early that its control circuit needs to live in uh, slash dev because that's the only thing uh, at the time that's uh, mounted rewritable as in uh, only the root file system is there. Um, so you cannot use uh, a var run like, like normal daemons because you might have um, a netboot NFS uh, environment there. Um, it handles all the interfaces um, and looks for the uh, autoconf6 flag which can be set with um, ifconfig or in the uh, host.myf file. Uh, this is the difference to DH client 
which only handles one interface, I believe. Yes. Uh, can you, Peter? You said yes. Can you can you uh, uh, run multiple DH clients these days, or? Yes, you, can. you can run multiple DH clients, and each one has one and only one interface. Yeah, that. Um, it, uh, yeah, it, it notices then when, um, so this is actually what happens, so the system comes up, uh, Slack to get started, and um, the interfaces are not configured yet, so it watches out for uh, Delta Flag on an interface change and starts to do its thing, but it uh, also handles when uh, you remove the autoconf uh, flag. And I ripped out the need for a config file, it only operates with um, flags on an interface. Mm, per, per default, uh, it generates the uh, semantically opaque uh, interface identifiers uh, based addresses. Uh, if that's disabled on an interface, uh, it, it falls back to the old uh, Mac based uh, approach. Um, it also uh, generates uh, privacy addresses per default. This can also be disabled. And um, when it adds a default route to the kernel, uh, it uh, has the empath flag set, which means that we can have multiple default routes. Mm, so one upshot here, or one, one idea with IPv6 is that you can have multiple default routers uh, on link, and they all give you prefixes, so we can handle it uh, with this. And DH client, uh, sorry, Slack D uh, uh, operating on, on multiple interfaces, uh, it also needs to add multiple default routes. Uh, so this makes that work. Um, so we have the, uh, the, these are basically uh, uh, all the tasks that the thing needs to handle. Uh, so I gave you the uh, overview, this is what we need from uh, IPv6, this is how um, uh, OpenBG, uh, OpenBSD uh, routing demons work. So we just need to glue this together, we have the three processes. So uh, we create a, a control socket in the, um, the main process. Uh, we create our um, raw sockets uh, again in the uh, main process. We receive router to transfers from the front end. We process those uh, in the engine. Uh, the front end sends uh, the router solicitations. The front end monitors the, uh, the interface state uh, via the uh, routing socket, so it sees when, uh, flag, when, when uh, something on an interface uh, changes. Uh, the same for uh, when the routing table uh, changes. Um, so, for example, someone by hand deletes a default route. Um, the, the idea is that a Slack D, uh, owns that part and will just uh, re-edit. Um, Peter actually ran into that problem where it disappeared. Uh, how did you trigger that? What was that? Do you uh, remember? On my laptop, in, when I resumed, it automatically ran L at a random. Oh, yeah. Which then deleted all the default addresses, recreated them, re-edited them. Yeah, and since since you since the default route um, uh, has that as the um, how does this uh, mapped in the routing table? Anyway, so the the problem is uh, it's linked. Uh, yeah, no, so yeah, uh, it deletes the link local address, so you lo lose the uh, the route to the uh, link local space to FE80, and yes, then that invalidates your default route. Um, right, two. Uh, it looks out for that, yeah, and uh, it needs to change the routing table. This is what the main process is doing for us. Um, configure the IP addresses, again, the main process. Um, listening on the uh, control socket that's done by the front end. Anyone have an idea whether, where we remove the control socket? Lots of demons got that wrong. Surprising. It's the main process. Yes. Lots of demons try to do the front end, but that's uh, because the front end is changed through the way, so it can't even reach this anymore. Also, it will not have the privilege to do that. And uh, we have our final state machine, which is uh, run by the engine. So with these things puzzled out, um, the next thing is, uh, how, how do we set up uh, a pledge for this? Uh, so on startup, the main process comes um, uh, unplatched, of course, and uh, we we generate we, we create a, a raw sockets there, that kind of thing. Um, once we have done that, we can uh, do the first pledge um, with a, a C path 
uh, send file descriptor and a W route. Um, I actually hugged it out with Theo here at BSD can. Uh, w route is going to be that name. Um, it's not in yet. Um, send file descriptor, so uh, we, we generate uh, for, or rather for the uh, full match of the uh, parts, we need to send the file descriptors to the other processes, so we need to fa send file descriptor uh, a pledge for that. And uh, CPath is for uh, deleting the, the control socket. Uh, socket. This is uh, um, changing uh, things on the file system. And once we have uh, the, um, the full mesh set up, uh, we no longer pass file descriptors around, so we can uh, stop doing the uh, send FDA. Um, the front end process again comes up uh, unpledged. Um, it needs to uh, receive uh, file descriptors um, because it gets the, uh, the those passed in. Um, for uh, accepting on the on the control socket, it needs the uh, Unix pledge uh, that allows it to do an accept there, and the route pledge is for um, uh, asking the kernel about um, interface state, the flex. Yes. Sorry, what's unveil as a thing? What would a daemon like this have for its unveil, if anything? Would it just be fully unveiled so that it sees nothing except maybe its um, file descriptor, or does it even need to have that? Doesn't after all, it doesn't need to do Yeah. Right. No, so, you, so you can unveil it with um, slash um, no flex, right? Well, yeah. Yes. Um, but no, it's yeah. Well, so all the things are uh, geo rooted in there anyway, except for uh, the, the the master process. Um, so actually, I have a slide for this uh, uh, later, so I can go into that. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think I was kind of done with this. Yes. Um, do you want to load the whole, uh, let the whole class know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want this for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, engine process, really easy. Uh, as I said before, uh, it's standard I.O. and only that. Um, it needs to have a receive file descriptor before because, well, it gets uh, the, the uh, um, message uh, socket passed in. Um, yes, so future work here. Uh, we need to get the um, W route patch in. That's for uh, changing the, the, the routing table or actually configuring an address. So uh, technically what we currently have in base committed, uh, the main process is not patched. Um, which actually has downsides. Um, but I'm, I'm developing this with a, a, I'm carrying a local patch for, for this in the kernel, and um, it is trivial. So uh, commit the, the, uh, the, the three liner in the, in the kernel, and um, the main process will also be patched. Mm, I think. Maybe I broke the neighbor unreachability detection in the kernel when I removed maybe too much code, or maybe MPI broke it. It's a bit unclear. Uh, it's also hard to debug. Um, so sometimes we have the, so there are reports with uh, uh, roaming users that the default route does not go away, and this is the issue. Uh, the kernel thinks uh, the default route is so you're on one uh, NAT, uh, close your laptop, go home, open it again. It still tries to use the, uh, the default route from, from your previous location. And it, with this, with the neighbor unreachability detection, it should notice um, that that is gone and that the default route can't be used. So you, you actually get a second one, but the problem is it uses the, the, the old one. Um, so it ha I was mentioning it has this um, half of a dynamic routing protocol. Currently, we're ignoring that. We really should uh, install those routes as well. Um, there are a few, so you, you could argue, well, it's not really a problem. We can just send the traffic to the default router, and, and we are good there. Um, there are topologies where that is not true. Um, well, this being uh, IPv6, there are probably more RFCs that are actually need to implement. 
Yeah. And um, it's not made up your own. Yeah, sure. But it's whatever person is doing. No, no. Uh, yeah, that would be, uh, I think that would be one that we uh, want, yes. Are you listening for the event person? Say again? Or are you listening for duplicate and protection event person? Um, kind of ish. Uh, I, I have a diff for that. Uh, for, um, so the kernel does not uh, export this currently to user land. Um, uh, I have a diff for that for the kernel to export this uh, over the, the, the route socket. Um, I'm, I'm currently holding off on that because it gets uh, again in the way of the fine grained locking. Uh, the, the, the issue currently is that I need to uh, grab the kernel lock, and there's uh, currently uh, heavy work uh, going on there. And I, I think it's it's nearly done that I no longer need to do that. Then it can get get in, and then uh, I can do the uh, duplicate address of detection failure. Do I have a copy of this? Hmm? Do I have a copy of this? You actually okayed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a three-liner. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that, that's the issue. Currently, it's, it's uh, just a zero. Uh, so we don't bump the counter. So uh, we hope for the best that there's no collision. And in practice, currently, there is no collision. You can, of course, force it. Was that the input for the, the DLL piece you need to make to work the process of that? Yes. Uh, and then um, exit pledges, which um, uh, the idea here is that the, the, the second argument to pledge is the, the parent process specifies what the child is uh, allowed to do. Um, so all the child process were coming up uh, unplatched. Um, this brings them up pledged. Um, we can no longer do childhood though, and this is then uh, also uh, in the in the context of uh, unveil. Um, so wh what's the point of change root here? Um, in, in that patch that I'm showing there uh, for the child process, it comes up with this. Um, there's nothing in there that allows it to read the file system. So if you're in a, in a var empty change route and you look around, this is a very weird place. There's a dot and dot dot, nothing else. And you're not allowed to do anything. With this patch, if you or if you have patch and you start to look around, you get killed. Um, so in that sense, this demon does not need unveil at all, uh, or the, the, the child does not need unveil because it will kill, get killed immediately if it tries to access anything in the file. Um, however, the um, the main process can change the file system. So there, uh, what we would do is um, unveil. Does this work? So either we need to unveil, uh, no, yes, Bob explained this. So <laughs> I was in this talk, and um, the, if I recall the semantics correctly, if you uh, unveil on a file name by name, right? Yes. yes. So the, uh, yeah, so that works. So what the main process would do is it would unveil slash dev slash d dot sock, and that's all. No, the problem is that uh, at what, well, uh, uh, where do you do the unveil and the pledge? After opening it. Yes. So then it doesn't matter, indeed. Good. Yes. So uh, then you can, uh, uh, then you would not even uh, do an unveil at all. So the unveil, well, say you just drop zero clicks. With, with yeah. unveil, you could do it before. Yeah. yeah. So you can create before it exists. Yeah. But, which is a bit silly because at that point it does not process any uh, untrusted data. So, yeah. But yeah. The, the, Indeed, indeed, yes. They reopen the config file, yes. So um, all the other network demons, like BGPD, uh, right. you can do a, a reload while the thing is, uh, is running. It does a reopen of the config file and uh, all the things. NC slash HTTP or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, indeed, indeed. So I, I guess I, just, just to clarify, if you pledge and then unveil, and you don't pledge anything related to file systems, the unveil might fail and crash and abort. I don't know what your semantic is with uh, unveil. The, um, oh, sorry, you didn't unveil. Yes. The idea is to call it just And I don't know what happens if you call unveil after pledge. I think you get an abort. But Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it's pointless if you can't access the file system. Yeah, it's so, it's yeah. So this daemon is really unique. No config file, nothing. Just yeah. It gets it all from the highest config. Yes. That that's why uh, unveil is uh, rather uninteresting here. Um, but. Um, from what Theo told me, the unveil is, re uh, is really interesting to, to combine with the uh, exec pledges for. Um, uh, well, if you have. No. So this is a simple demon. Yes. No. no I'm not not talking about this. Uh, the, so uh, in the in the um, unveil is not very interesting for uh, routing demons. Neither are yeah. exec pledges. No. Well, once they patch, they cannot exec anymore. Oh, they re exec themselves. The others. We're getting lost in the weeds. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's also not that interesting. Um, actually. What's that more? No. Yes. <laughs> uh, now we can go back. Yeah. Now we can get back. So, yeah, questions. <laughs> yes. So, did you have to work around a lot in infoconfig to support maybe some extra options or stuff like that? So, um, No, that w that was already in place since um, all this functionality was uh, previously in the kernel. The kernel configuration from uh, Flex, so that was all in place. Uh, I had to to add one to disable the um, uh, semantically opaque uh, interface identifiers. Th that's a new feature. That's also a flag, but um, that's that's pretty simple. So you you go into ifconfig, look at how the flags are already implemented, and add one more. So if I add an interface dynamically, you know, yeah. something or another, and I want to add um, IPv6, mm -hmm. would I have to restart the daemon? No. It, it can handle uh, appearing interfaces. Okay. Actually, it's, it's the same message that you get um, when you um, Forgot what the exact name of the, so, but if you change the flags, um, you you get an there's a new interface. Okay. Uh, you don't get the message. Um, the following flag is now set, but something happened to this interface, and then you go and yeah, find out what's going on there. Yeah. No, not not. Uh, yeah. The, the key, yes. Right? So for the uh, semantically opaque uh, interface identifiers, you need a key. Um, we store that in the kernel because we generate link local addresses in the kernel. So we and they also get this treatment. So the, the key actually needs to be in the kernel. Uh, and this is uh, um, we do this with a with a sys control. That's the easiest way to to shove that in. And the uh, um, Slack D is allowed to get that key out of the kernel. But yes, that, that's the point. Storing a file and loaded on from reboot. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, on uh, it's handled like the uh, SSH host keys or the the IC D keys on uh, so on boot it checks. That file there. If not, it just gets uh, created. But it's debatable on how secret this is. Uh, I would not worry too much if that gets leaked. That's my picture. Yeah. The the intention of the file, the intention of the is specifically so. So.
Also, this thing is uh, supposedly uh, portable across BSDs. So, if someone wants to do that, uh, please ask me. I'll just be looking at it. Don't worry. No, no, no. no. I suppose so, yes. Yeah. Um, There, there is actually um, a, a thing. Um, oops. Where did I have this? Right. So, if we uh, uh, this needs a bit of uh, refactoring uh, when, when we uh, do the exec planches, things get shoveled around a bit more and. We need to get rid of the, the, the change root there, and we need to get rid of the, the, the priv drop. Um, so we, for, for portable, this needs, to, uh, this needs to stay in there. Um, because, well, if you, if you don't have pledge, you actually make it uh, less secure. Um, but that, that's something that we need to handle on how to do that. And uh, I understand we have some experience with that. Oh, no, no, I, I meant uh, as a general, um, so how we do um, OpenSSH uh, uh, portable, how, how we do uh, um, OpenNTPD uh, portable, those kind of things. To be quite uh, honest, in this case, I don't see the point of changing this at all. The parent process needs root for other reasons. Starting to children is root and then drop the privileges, what's the problem to fix that? It's not a big Just problem, no. It's just it's Yes. It be Yeah, there it's uh, I think it's uh, rather boring there. No, I'm saying if we uh, go this way. Um, There's a bit of the irony in the entire patch thing, actually. If you're patching the software, then you'll probably never need it. <laughs> Whereas all the third party shit is one patch, which is what would probably need. So I had this ex so example. So this is um, we, we have belt suspenders. Someone put us in a straitjacket and tossed it into a room without uh, padded walls and without windows. So. Exactly. So 
Yes. So you were saying that um, NTPD, uh, that this NTPD it might actually be true? Uh, not sure. It violated a uh, pledge. So what's going on about uh, the control token where it gets deleted and that all the demons got this wrong? Uh, I found this with pledge. So previously they, they just lock, I can't, uh, uh, so they, they shut down and then uh, uh, this gets locked somewhere. It actually uh, gets into the DMAT uh, message buffer because the, the logging system is already shut down at that point. <laughs> so, it, yeah, I can't remove the control socket. Nobody ever noticed that the socket no. was Yeah. Great. And uh, then, then I have it pledged and I shut it down and I get a sick board and that's weird. Why does it happen? Oh, that's why. Oops. <laughs> yep. It's certainly interesting to do that for the, the, the main process. Absolutely. Because you cannot yeah. change with that. Yeah, that becomes interesting. Actually, I think the more interesting case is actually the demons that need to be DNS at runtime, like NTPD. In NTPD, the DNS process cannot change through because it needs results.com and it needs YP, or yeah. it might need YP depending on the system configuration. Yes. So it cannot change through. Mm -hmm. So yes. there, on real, completely different stuff. Yes. Session of my leave. Seven. Uh, yes. Okay. Anything else? Shall we go? Thanks.